Morgan and I am a professor here at the University of Alaska Southeast Ketchikan campus and one of the classes that I get to teach is a science class. This year it's a biology class talking about the different things that live in this region, Natural History of Alaska. Um, and I teach that class for the Tribal Scholars Program which is a high school program for students, um, indigenous students, um, freshman through senior year and I have asked them to make posters this year for Indigenous Peoples Day for our celebration, which they graciously did. They did a fabulous job of them. I'm so proud of the work that they have done. The assignment was to choose something from the natural environment in this area that they felt some kind of a connection to, and then find information about it, um, common name, scientific name, at least one native name, a description of the item, where you would harvest it for, from, and what you'd use it for, and then some interesting facts. Everybody did a really fabulous job of that. Um, a couple of students in particular have really uh, taken that to heart. This student right here wanted to be able to talk about cedar because she had recently learned how to weave cedar bark into baskets and has pictures here of work that, that she did and her brother did and her aunt had done. So that is a really personal connection um, that she had. Um, this student wanted to do halibut because he loves going out and halibut fishing with his family and etc. So the, um, there's a lot of really wonderful work here. A few more posters over on this side. Um, killer whale. This person right here wanted to do sled dogs, which I allowed, even though it's not from the natural world around here, so to speak. But he very fondly remembers his fourth grade teacher running the Iditarod and having her dogs there for him to be able to, to, to meet and greet and pet. And so that was a really strong personal connection. And then this student right here actually has an example of her work. Um, she had learned how to do raven's tail weaving and wanted to highlight that on her poster. So all of the work that the students did is really fantastic and I'm really proud of them and um, really happy to be having these on display for our Indigenous Peoples Day celebration. I wanted to welcome everybody to our Indigenous Peoples Day event. Um, we are actually going to be streaming this live, uh, so hopefully you're watching this on Monday, October 11th. Um, and I wanted to start actually with some breaking news that happened this afternoon, um, which is President Joe Biden signed a declaration declaring it Indigenous Peoples Day across the country, and he's the first president that's done so. Um, We've had it in Alaska since 2015, or at least declared. Um, and so I think this is an interesting step forward. Uh, today, we've got uh, uh, several um, of our valued elders in the community, Richard and Janice Jackson, here with us. And we'd like to thank them for coming um, a second time. I think they were here last year with us on Indigenous Peoples Day as well. Um, and taking some time out of their day to come uh, share with us a little bit about um, their history in Ketchikan and also their involvement in cultural education in Ketchikan. Um, so first I'd like to kind of turn it over maybe to Priscilla, you can introduce yourselves and then we can have Richard and Janice give us a little introduction as well. Well, thank you, Jan. I'm Priscilla Schulte, the campus director and also anthropology professor. And I've worked with Esther Shea for many, many years, and that's Richard Jackson's mother. Um, and I was really honored that she spent so much time teaching us. And I'm so excited to see that what the efforts she made are being passed on with the youth. And Richard and Janice are working hard to perpetuate the knowledge with the youth through the Tongass Clinket Cultural Heritage Institute. Uh, and behind us, we see the posters of some of the young people, and I know if Esther were here, she would be so pleased to see the young Alaska Native youth from Ketchikan Indian community learning about the resources that surround us here. So I'm honored to be here today, and so happy that Richard and Janice have been willing to come and talk to us. And I'll now introduce Richard and Janice Jackson. 
Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, my wife and I just came from an Alaska Native Brotherhood Grand Camp meeting, uh, and uh, my involvement with the tribe is uh, traditionally is, is, is a clan leader, a clan leader for the Tonda Corner or Tongas, Tikwe D, Bear, Kotit, man who married a brown bear clan. And my wife is from Yakutat, originally from her clan side, but she'll, she'll introduce herself. Um, we started getting involved with my, uh, formerly with uh, teaching the heritage of the Tongass Clinket because we needed to connect with the younger kids that we train uh, so they get a good foundation in language, arts, um, skills in uh, subsistence and um, arts as far as uh, carving, uh, painting, um, textiles, which are my wife does. And I do storytelling about the historical perspective of, uh, of this area. And just as a comment, just this month, um, film that I worked on with uh, Mark Schaefer is going to be judged uh, for a big award from uh, Ken Burns. It's one of six films that made it as finalists and it's, and it's called Expose, Exposing My Bridge. Um, Edward Mybridge came to Alaska with the Army and went to Tongass Island and took the first pictures of indigenous people in Alaska. It might have been the first pictures in Alaska as far as I know. And we went out there and uh, had a really good time visiting our traditional village and got really inspired and felt the energy of our ancestors. So I'll leave it at that and then my wife can do her comments. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Priscilla, for inviting us to be here for Indigenous Peoples Day. We're really happy and um, the crew for being here with us today. Um, we're always happy to celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day. It's quite an honor to have that every year. And um, Richard Knight, along with Priscilla, did start a nonprofit, the Tongass Clinket Institute, to teach the arts and to teach culture camp with the local youth every year. And so this year we had 33 children and 14 families. And um, it was all virtual this year, but it was pretty fantastic to see the children catch on to the um, form line design, to history, um, to the, the pouch making and the eagle feather project. So um, we just really hope to do that every single year. And it's really awesome to come here today and look at the posters that the tribal scholars have made on um, their cultural connections with the forest and the land and to look at um, the learnings that they're doing with the raven's tail and the moose and the killer whale. It's really exciting. Good job, everybody. <laughs> well, thank you for that introduction. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of start by is because you've been involved in a few indigenous people's days, um, what are some of the things that you think are important to remember um, as we commemorate indigenous peoples in Alaska and elsewhere um, throughout the United States? Well, it's important to remember that Alaska has 229 tribes out of almost half of the tribes in America. From real small villages to the largest one, which is pretty much Ketchikan and Juneau. There, in this area, there's about 5,000 or 6,000 counting those who have lived out, live outside of the area. In, in the area, there's 2,500. And what's important about here is um, we are habitating in this one small island with three different nations, primarily. Uh, because of the um, e economy and it changed in Ketchikan, many of them moved here for, you know, finding jobs and income. So we have uh, a lot of children that go to school here that are Clinkett, Ida, and Simpson. Not to forget 
the Aleuts had stayed here during the World War II. They were interned because of the Japanese invasion. They went back home and they found out their villages weren't in good shape for a lot of reasons. They came back. In fact, our mayor of Kitsikan was Aleut, Mr. Severson. And we're proud of that. You know, we got somebody that came up there that moved into our town and they're doing well. And um, what, what, what's important to remember is that there's, there's an established group of people that live here and they continue to live here uh, as, as we do. And many of them have left. Uh, originally during Tongass Island, prior to when they moved to Tongass Island, there were about 700. And prior to that, there was about 1,800 all the way up to Port and Canal, Port Stewart. And that dwindled not because of conflict, but because of uh, illnesses, like the pandemic. We had, uh, we had smallpox that was introduced by the sailing ships. We had the measles and uh, chicken pox, devastating. And then everybody in town, like the pandemic now, uh, were affected by the flu of, of I think it was 1918, where it took out a lot of people. So our, our, our group, by the time they got to Kitsikan, they're down to less than um, 160, right, right around there. And they, they moved it from Tongass Island to Ketskhan, which means under the wings of an eagle, because there was a nice uh, area near the Ketchikan Creek, which was had a large supply of fish that went up, natural supply. And back in those days, I can recall when I was young, uh, when we look at herring and oligans, it was really a large amount. And because of uh, overfishing, first of all, trying to get keep a sustainable yield now, whatever that is, and worst of all, now we have global warming that's dwindled. In fact, the Unic River, which is one of our traditional areas, have no, no, no oligans to sustain harvesting, which was one of our main places to go. So we, we lie to do a lot of our... Uh, our uh, replenishing our, our traditional foods by trading or, you know, with somebody that can do it. Sometimes someone from Canada will come up, we call him a nas man, a grease man, come up with grease and he'd sell us one of our foods. But now we can't do that because the ferries broke down. So things are getting a little short here. So we find out ways, I know that people that do stuff, I'll meet them and I'll, I'll barter. Usually it's money because I know as this is the opportunity. If I don't take this chance, it's gone. So yesterday I bartered for a case of smoked salmon, and I forgot today you have to go pick it up. But <laughs> we've been busy today, and it was exciting. Uh, what you you know, what's unique about our people is no different than any other group. They have uh, they have their traditions, and you should honor them. And I find it interesting when I do see other you know groups and how they do stuff. In fact, my mother's. Uh, Dad was was half Irish. He was Clinket and Irish from Brangle. So I, I always have a little uh, noticing of the t Irish tradition and think, yeah, that's where a part of me is from. And I can tell you it's from County Down in Ireland. I found it, I figured that out. So the heritage of a person is important if you can find it. In our, in our way, a long time ago, you used to be able to find it by just a name. If you're a Clinket, you just say your name, they know where you came from. No language, no who am I business. Just say your name and they could tell you, oh, you're from that clan in that village. It belongs to the people from there and doesn't go out of it. <clears throat> in fact, those names are just, they give it the sustained in, the symbolic immortality by being dedicated and given to another person at, at pro probably the memorial colleague of a. Uh, of someone you, that has passed on, and they gave his name to his children. So it goes on and on and on, perpetuates itself. So that's the thing that I learned from my mother, as well as the other elders that, in Ketchikan. And mm -hmm. we, we continue it on as, as, as a traditional league as we can. Do I answer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think it's important to uh, recognize Indigenous Peoples Day so that we don't forget um, 
people like Esther Shea, who taught Tlingit language and singing and dancing for many, many years in Ketchikan. And it gives us an opportunity to remember Esther and to say her name. And um, in Tlingit tradition, the belief is that when you um, say an ancestor's name, then they can continue to live on. Um, and so it's important to remember people like Esther and um, and to teach it to the kids so that um, they can have a you know strong foundation of who was here before and their identity now and then how that's going to go into the future. So thank you. And her, her name is in Clinton is Tahye. That means sunshine coming out of a basket. It's a real positive way of, you know, looking at the bright, brightness of the person. And that was my mother. She had a sense of humor and she's witty, real witty. She loved to um, play tricks on you or see how you respond to things she said and then have a good chuckle at your expense. <laughs> and that's how she was. So then my name is, uh, one of my names which I got from Angoon is Gooch Chinu. And I asked him, what does that mean? He said, hired wolf will get things done. <laughs> <laughs> and my real name is uh, Kushakak, which belonged to my uncle. He gets confused with Kushtaka, which is a different name. I, and you have to listen to me when I say it, Kushakak. And it, and it was my uncle William Andrews, his name. It was a very old name, and I'm proud of it, and uh, given to me at birth from my grandmother. Her name was Ka Ken, Alice, Alice Harris, or originally Alice Brown. Her dad was Shaw Clan, which is a subdivision up here. They named after him uh, when they built the housing up, uh, up on Jackson Street. My grandfather, great-grandfather. And uh, his wife was Marion, Sean, and uh, they came from Hongus Island down to the Creek Street area and built their houses down there near uh, the Chief Johnson Hole, which is where, where I said before the creek was where they went fishing. Um, uh, well, my English name is Janice Jackson, and my Clinket name is Anchkwanuk, and it comes from Yakutat, and it means settlement of a village, and it was given to me at a Clinket um, traditional party in Juneau. And I, I try to live up to that name because it means it's really important, and so um, I try to give back to the community, you know, in an important way that I can. So it has a lot of meaning to me. Thank you. I could go away from here and I, you know, I'll start thinking about, you know, what things that we do and I don't do because I'm not in catch can, but there's just a lot of uh, good things that happen here and uh, acknowledgments that have happened, particularly in catch can last year. I got a call from one of the council members and they wanted to recognize the indigenous people here. And the city council did. I worked with the, that person and we came up with a simple statement, this is the indigenous land of the Tongas. And that was really nice. They do, uh, through their ordinance, every meeting they acknowledge the traditional people, which is a custom. With us, if somebody came to town from Heidelberg or even from KIC even, we would make up a vote. 89 tribes, if you believe it or not, from all over. They would get up and say we're on the indigenous land. If they were up at Ted Ferry of the, the Tondaquan, and they'd be, be more specific, they'd say the Galakari, which is a uh, Tongas ravens. So it's nice to see those protocols. And uh, those things didn't happen until recently. So that's a, it's a growth thing. We, 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 we appreciate it as a people, and um, I, I can't ask for anything better than that, except that we work together and uh, do things together like we do here today. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say just a few words. Um, I really appreciated you bringing up names, um, because uh, my, my family is actually from Heidelberg. Mm -hmm. um, and we sort of lost the tradition of giving names um, a generation ago. And my grandfather, um, Albert Brown, uh, decided 
he wasn't going to see Kaida around his children. Um, and so um, that tradition of giving names sort of um, stopped for a generation or two, actually three. Um, and my aunts and uncles uh, came together about <coughs> four years ago, and we decided to do a naming ceremony and adoption ceremony for those of us like myself who have a father that's Haida, but not a mother that's Haida, um, so that we could all uh, be part of that responsibility. And I received the name Hawandak, which was the name of my great, 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 great grandmother. Um, and it helps me remember to that I'm part of this community and that I have responsibilities both to my family and to the community. Um, and so I wanted to kind of segue from that into having you both talk about maybe uh, the work that you've been doing in cultural education uh, with the youth, um, because I feel like that's such an important part of people reconnecting and understanding and rebuilding those links of responsibility and, and uh, community with each other. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about your work with Culture Camp, um, but I'd also like to hear about some of the challenges you've had this past year, because I know it's been an, a different kind of, of year in terms of uh, reaching students. Well, before my wife, uh, she, she does the program with, with Priscilla, before she, we talk about it, I want to talk about your family. Um, Albert Brown wrote a lot of little wrote articles for the newspaper. He was a soft-spoken man. He had a brother who looked like him. Or be able to hear great uncle, I think. And I went to school during the time John was John Brown was pretty well known as one of the best basketball players that ever lived in this <laughs> Alaska. Uh, they won the championship four years in a row from the time he was a freshman until a senior. And then he had the unfortunate uh, experience, like I did it end up going to Vietnam. As long as your brother, your, your uncle George, is George your uncle or your uncle grandfather? He's my uncle. Okay. So, um, and later on he became, um, through time he became a um, general manager of KIC. He was pretty involved. And, uh, but along with uh, Sue Pickerel, one of your family. And now uh, her son, involved there. So you have a real involvement with uh, our community. And I admire that because, um, frankly, you could just have a job. I've done jobs where I worked for the university as a maintenance supervisor at Juno. I worked at the Pioneer as a, you know, a journeyman mechanic and on the ferry system as a junior engineer. Those are jobs. The extent of it is you stop when you get off work, you go home. But there are things you do that are called public service, similar to what we're doing. What fills your life? What fills your life with a sense of self-worth? If watching TV and football games and baseball games and basketball games, that's all you do, then you're not filling in that emotional or part of you that says, I make a difference besides just myself. So we get involved, and I've been doing that with my wife for a long time. And so we decided one day we were walking around the park that, hey, we should perpetuate my mother's history. And then we got we got into uh, discussing how do we do that, and we became a nonprofit. And then we said, well, we can't get any funding unless we become a technical mom nonprofit, meaning it recognized by the IRA. So with Priscilla, Priscilla's help and Janice's help. We submitted for a official nonprofit status for the IRA 501c3. First time around, we got it. I, can, I was shocked. <laughs> so some, some people don't have a hard time getting it because they, they don't fill it out properly. We got it. And then we started getting funding from First Alaska and CSC Alaska and Click Haida. And this was associated with our, our, our culture camp. So we get the funding, work with uh, Alice Bogoya from Chicago Haida. We talked to Sea Alaska, uh, one of her families on their board, and they, they, they gave us some funding. And we even went to, we got funding from a group called Awesome. Awesome Foundation. Awesome Foundation. So I guess we're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, so then, you know, the next part is, you know, going beyond yourself, say, what's our needs? What is our need? So 
we sat down and it's like, well, what, what, what was our, and I'll, I'll turn to my wife who is probably going to review all that if she can. Uh, thank you, Richard. I just wanted to give credit to um, some awesome people who helped our little <laughs> organization to become awesome. Um, Priscilla Schulte, Dr. Schulte, she helped us with the documents and the, she's our treasurer. And so she keeps us in line, you know, financial wise, and we feel really secure with that. So, um, gonna cheese, Priscilla. Thank you. And it's really um, the hard work of dedicated people like Dr. Schulte that helps at least our nonprofit as well as the college to do really good things. And we're we're pretty grateful for that. And my sister Gail Dabala, she lives in Juneau. When we first went to Juneau. And we decided that we wanted to make a nonprofit, um, mostly in part to carry forward Esther Shea's good work that she did with children. Uh, my sister Gail sat down at the computer and said, OK, you have to do this, you have to do that. And she submitted um, these documents, um, one, I believe, to the IRS right off the bat to help get our uh, tax exemption status. And the other one was. Um, the actual document to the state to apply for you know, the state license. And then there was um, the other documents that we had to do, the Articles of Incorporation and the, um, the bylaws. So it was quite a lot. It was a lot of paperwork. And so these awesome ladies really helped us to get this off the ground. Otherwise, it would still be an idea. Um, so this is our third year now. And so we've done um, three culture camps, the Esther Shea Native Arts Institute, we call it. And it's for local children. You know, if any of the tribal scholars want to help us, we do it every summer. And Clinkett and Haida does fund us. And we were funded by Sea Alaska Corporation, as well as the BIA and the Awesome Foundation. Um, and First Alaskans Institute funded us last year. So um, this year, we, we only got funded by Clinkett and Haida, so it was really a streamlined, just virtual culture camp. And we offered classes to where kids could learn how to draw Clinkett form line design. And Priscilla's grandkids, Bentley in particular, really caught on to that. It was incredible. Just with a couple of hours, he yeah. was able to draw a form, two form line designs. Mm -hmm. And that's something that some often takes two weeks to be able to do that at the Totem Heritage Center. But, you know, kids are so absorbent and they're so smart and, you know, they, they can learn things just right off the bat. So that's what we're hoping to do is to catch the kids when they're young and plant the seeds and help it to grow and help them with their identity of becoming who they are. Do you have any favorite moments from uh, these culture camps? I didn't quite hear that. Oh, uh, do you have any favorite moments uh, from these culture camps working with the, with the youth? Well, for me, it was um, we went to Ward Lake and had a, you know, a day after we finished our project and took pictures and had a picnic and then races. <laughs> there was a little girl that her name is Macy. We needed pictures to take for, you know, when you ask for reports and you have pictures in there that really that smile she had was just unbelievable <laughs> <laughs> we like it you know you you got amazing you have a picture with somebody like that and they're, they're really happy what was what was going on when she was asked to say something and clink it and she she was looking up with my sister martha Ann, and she just was really kind of bashful <laughs> and smiling and it was just beautiful because you know when we were little my mother and father both spoke perfect clinker. Unfortunately, they went to boarding schools, and that's another issue. The boarding schools were uh, Christian oriented and sometimes uh, government. They were contracted by the government. It was, a, it was the age of assimilation. We want to get the, they basically call us uncivilized. And to become a citizen, you had to forgo all your traditions. <clears throat> so when you went to these schools, my mother went to Sheldon Jackson. Mm -hmm. She was forbidden to speak Clinkett. She was a little eight-year-old girl. And she was by herself. But she had a brother. 
But he wasn't from our people. He was from Haida, but I can't know if he's from Kassan, Dexter Wallace. He saw my mother was all by there by herself, and so he became her caretaker. He watched over her all the way till he passed away. They used to meet together because they talked about when they went to school. Well, my mom spoke the language there. They put her in the meditation room, they call it. Kind of an odd name for, you know, you're being punished for speaking your language. So there was a room which just had a mattress on it, and you had to sit there and, you know, they say meditate, but it's actually, you know, you're worried because you feel you did something that's naturally your right to do, and that's to speak your language. So when they got out of school, they come home, They've been told not to speak the language. They get married, my wife, my father as well. He went to Wrangell Institute. So did my mother later on. But when she was little, she went to Shelly Dak. They, they, they were indoctrinated, so we, they didn't approach us to speak a language. They spoke among themselves with my, my, my grandmother. So I grew up not really with a connection to it. And I, I feel I'm really sad about that because had they just become natural with it, it would have been a, just an asset. It would have been beautiful. You know, it's like yes. you see, I go back to a traditional world. The other side of me, when I see somebody in Ireland speak, speak their Irish language, Gaelic, I said, wow, that's a different language. Not English. <laughs> it's their own language. It's who you are or else. I said, wow, that's cool. And I feel sad that, you know, that was uh, something that was done because I didn't think it was a Pretty to anyone, you were just being yourself. But unfortunately, that's what happened. And the way that the first uh, uh, superintendent of Indian Affairs up here, or education, I think it was, IBE, was, was, um, was Shelton Jackson. So he was charged with getting these schools going. And they got churches in it, and they got government schools that already existed. And they were trying to. Uh, assimilate all the natives, which is an impossible task, because you're always going to be who you are, you're always going to honor it, you're going to wear your regalia, you're going to sing your songs. Our, our step was preservation, because it was there. My mother had it already written down. She wrote down all the songs. She taped them. She made sure when she left this world we had something to work with. And she taught my wife, and my wife work, work, has worked with her as well as Esther Littlefield and others in town to perpetuate an art. And she had my brother Norman, luckily, mm -hmm. who went to school for two years, two years of drawing before he even carved. Two years of drawing. And so he's very natural. It's like you watch those shows of, it's not a cartoon, but you watch those shows of artists that do cartoons. You go, wow, how did they do that? They, they, they've learned it. So my brother, he, we go through the struggle of what do we put on our art, and I said, let's just call Norman up. <laughs> of course, when we, he does art for us, there's a responsibility. If he gives it to us, it's one thing, but if we want it, we purchase it. Then it becomes ours. It's yeah. not. And there's some art you can't purchase. That's called our atu. That belongs to those people. Their clan, their clan song, their clan stories. It's who they are. So those are they stay within, like our names. They stay within your family or your clan. They're passed on. And uh, so, if you, if some folks come up and ask us about their identity, and we can answer it uh, by they telling us who their family is. They can root it, go to, through their lineage back to their their original family. And we're, we're lucky in Alaska because we're only, in my case, I'm only a third generation away from the woods. Yes. I'd say we're, we're from the village. It's a different. Now, if you go to New York or the East Coast, I had a person when I was in the tribe, and, and they're legally, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. We, 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 we just identify the, the original people, and they qualify under the, having, uh, what they call it, in enrollment, I went back seven generations with somebody. That's what Elvis Presley was. So they can identify their their family and where they came from. They're they're included. So that's 
and then you know they acknowledge it. Some some people don't know they are, and they're not so good to go up and tell them. I know your family. I know your history. I know you know the good people that you, you come from. So and that doesn't doesn't just uh, belong on my Clinket side. I mentioned it sometimes in other people. You know, Heidelberg, uh, Alakala, because we intermarry. We intermarry with each other, and uh, like Janus is three three nations. Mm -hmm. Janus, Clinket, Simshian, and Haida. Um, actually, my grandma was born in Metlakatla, but she, because of the flu epidemic, she was um, sent to Yakutat to be raised because the flu epidemic was affecting the communities and the villages so badly that she had to be raised outside of her family um, with an aunt up in Yakutat. So that was um, kind of an interesting part of our family history. But I wanted to go back to the question that Jen posed about a favorite time during the culture camp. One of my favorite times was the first culture camp we did three years ago, and we brought everybody out to Ward Lake. And the kids were so excited to be outside, you know, in a beautiful setting, and it had been raining and raining and raining all morning, just buckets and buckets of rain. And we called everybody and said, do we need to cancel or what? <laughs> Oh, no, actually, Sue Pickerel said, no, you, we better just do it, you know, and <laughs> just that go forward and do it. So we packed everything up, and everybody met us out at the lake, and then it stopped raining for about an hour and a half. <laughs> and so all the kids showed up, almost all of the kids, and it was so wonderful because we got them singing and dancing right there um, by Ward Lake. And as it turns out, that's near one of the... Um, interment places of where the Aleut people were in, interred um, in the 1940s. And so, so that has a really sad history attached to it, you know, where people died. And there's some grief and there's some unresolved feelings about that, you know, from the um, Unangan people and even today. So the fact that we brought the children out there, I think a couple of them too were part Unangan. Mm -hmm. And that they were dancing and singing right there on that land where there was a sad history was really one of my favorite parts mm -hmm. of our culture camp. And we hope to do that next year. We, we went with my mother to uh, different places uh, before she left, left us. She's still with us in her, in her spirit. But one of the places we went to was Tesla. And they did the same thing. They had a cultural event, and they had a they had a races. <laughs> Janice raced in, in this race, and she almost beat my brother Norman. <laughs> he was he was racing along, thing. He was really really doing pretty good, and they were starting to yell because he he was she was starting to pass him when Norman looked over. He starts really moving. <laughs> so we went up there. Be happy in Ketchikan. You don't have these. Giant mosquitoes they have up in the Yukon. <laughs> Man, they were suck your blood dry, you know. <laughs> we, we was, they were huge. <laughs> and they didn't even bother. We were by this big lake. It was a freshwater lake. Tesla Lake, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Just huge. It was freshwater. And uh, I thought it was the ocean. We couldn't even see the other side, mm -hmm. inside of Canada. But it was really fun to go. And it, ultimately, it comes down to, you know, Excitement of uh, your culture, mm -hmm. your identity. We take uh, children that uh, sometimes there's special special needs. They don't they don't they don't have a, a nuclear family. Maybe they're fostered out. We uh, or they we have children that were you know referred to us by their their mother and father who aren't their real biological mother and father. So we could strengthen their character. The cultural. And, and we become uncle, uncles and aunts to them. Mm -hmm. So, and even call us uncle and aunt, you know. I, it's like um, when I was a boy, um, Delbert Nix from the Heidelberg was a good friend with my mom. And he, he'd come up there and I'd say to my mom, I, did, I didn't know what I was saying, I said, Chinny's here. <laughs> <Saying> grandpa. <laughs> I just thought that was his name. 
and I just started calling him Tinny, just like <laughs> everybody else did. So we dropped we did, we dropped the names of people's culture, which sometimes are the names are the same, like in Haida, when you say hoots or bear, we say hoots, same thing. So you you look out to different places, sometimes the names are the same. Um, before we wrap things up, I just wanted to mention that Priscilla's daughter, Monique, she has Esther's Quickening. Right. Yeah, so Monique was able to um, receive Esther Shea's Clinket name. Right, so her name is Tafie, and again, it means the sunshine out of the basket. It's a deep basket full of knowledge. And so now that she carries that name, the name goes on. Mm -hmm. And will go on from time immemorial. Yeah, and her dad's from the Tongas too. Right. It's from the Raven side. So it's, it's if you were, didn't, if you, we have taken care of this when, we, when there's a marriage outside of our people and they come into our family, we, we get to balance it out by finding a, cl a close relationship clan and we give them a name so they're the Eagle Raven, mutual, mutual uh, marriage where one side is a raven, which is or in some cases the wife or the husband, and the other side is an eagle. So, so you can, and you can, uh, Reciprocate, reciprocate in, in parties and in dancing and singing, and in those type of traditional events. So that's how my mother did it, and uh, the same with Priscilla. Priscilla, her, her daughter is a uh, raven, so she she click. She's no, she's eagle, right? She's eagle, she's and, and Priscilla be raven. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are things that you balance out, so that. You're not left out. You're part of the family. Yeah, so Monique's father's a raven, so that's why Esther adopted us as brown bear. Mm -hmm. And out of respect for his mother, who was um, a well thought of raven, mm -hmm. and that's what Esther would say. So it's who comes before me and who comes after us. That's really important for, it's even more important than just a person who is affiliated with your, yeah. your, uh, classes or something you like and you get adopted. It's more important because her, her father, Priscilla's daughter's father, is part of Tongas. So we're going to make sure it's, it's correct so she became adopted into the Bear Clan and that's for life. Uh, it's just important to us, you know, it means a lot. So, <clears throat> and she was kind enough to help us in our or endeavors, which we feel pretty good about. Thank you. Well, this seems like a bit of a natural stopping point for us. Um, I'd like to thank you again for a really great conversation about connection and celebration. Um, I love uh, your story, Janice, about the singing at Ward Lake, um, because I do think it's something we need to be celebrating. Um, Indigenous Peoples Day recognizes a difficult past, but it's also new beginnings and, and bringing joy as well, uh, and pride uh, with being Indigenous, being Haida, being Tlingit, being Sinchan. Um, so thank you very much. I just want to thank UAS and um, Dr. Schulte for inviting us here today. It was really nice to um, acknowledge Indigenous Peoples Day this way, and uh, I want to encourage people to come up and see the beautiful posters that the tribal scholars did. They're really nice. A lot of thought went into them. And to come up and check out a book or two, I see one on Elizabeth Pradovich that I'd like to check out. And it looks like a really great book collection. So please come up to the UAS library and check out some books and look at the beautiful posters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.